Hi everyone, my name is Amanda Wallmeyer and I am the local history librarian here at the Johnson County Library. Thank you for attending today's program, The Past is Prologue, Corinthian Nutter and the South Park School. The Past is Prologue is a new monthly program offered by the Johnson County Library where we highlight topics that are often left out, glossed over, or misrepresented in our history books. Our presenter today is Mr. Andrew R. Gustafson. Andrew is the Curator of Interpretation at the Johnson County Museum, where he hosts programs, manages the social media, curates temporary exhibits, and maintains and updates the permanent exhibit, which includes a section on the South Park School case. So now, please join me in welcoming Mr. Andrew Gustafson. Thanks so much. I'm really glad to be here. Um, thanks for asking me uh, to give this talk. This is a really interesting topic um, and a, a portion of the Johnson County uh, history that I love to talk about when we go on our on tours through the exhibition um, here at the museum. So I'm talking about um, the South Park School case, and I've come to realize that this history is not well known um, to residents in Johnson County. It's a vitally important history uh, because it's about social justice and civil rights. It also is a story of a community coming together, um, fighting uh, and overcoming a major obstacle uh, to success, namely racism and segregation within their community. And it's a relevant history, uh, one with recent national, uh, with the re recent national protest movement and continued discussions of rights, who has a voice in communities and what the future should look like. Uh, it's very relevant today. I do wanna acknowledge before I start that this is a complex story with lots of people who were involved uh, there are folks who are still living, um, who lived through this era, uh, whose parents and grandparents were historical actors in these events. And so I, I just want to preface that I'm telling a simplified version of this very complex story um, from the sources that I have available to me. So a little bit of background before I, I launch into the presentation. Um, the main events took place in 1948 and 1949, a little more than 70 years ago. To set the stage, Johnson County was in the beginnings of the prosperous period that followed World War II. The movement towards the suburbs was picking up. Um, it had been happening in Johnson County for about 25 years already, but Prairie Village, the county's largest suburban development up to that point, was under development starting in 1946. So we're talking about a Johnson County that was leaving its rural agricultural past behind and starting to become uh, much more recognizable to us today. So knowing that, um, would it surprise you um, if I told you that Johnson County had a desegregation case that predated the Brown v. Board of Education in 1954? Would it surprise you um, that an entire school walked out in support of equal access to education? Or that the county's first NAACP chapter was formed in response to the situation? Or that Shawnee Mission North High School was integrated in 1949 as a result of this episode in history? Maybe you already knew this um, and maybe you don't. So I'll give a little bit of background on South Park where these events are taking place. Uh, it's a small community just north of Merriam um, and today it's actually been annexed into Merriam. It's just south of the Wyandotte County line and that perhaps is the origin of the community's name although no one really knows for sure why it was called South Park. South Park's bounded by 48th and 50th streets and Antioch and Knox streets. So it's not a large area. Uh, it was developed in the 1880s as a quote unquote garden suburb. Um, as best we can tell, it was integrated from the start with black and white families living next door to each other, their, their children attending the sco same school um, and adults working together in the community. It was described in the early 1900s as a farming community with lots of folks who were working agricultural jobs there. Uh, being so close to Johnson County's um, main areas of agriculture. There were several hundred homes there, a school building, uh, and a few churches. The school was integrated sometime, but uh, was uh, segregated, excuse me, sometime between the late 1890s and 1912, when a second school was built for white students only, relegating black students to the old one-room schoolhouse um, that was called South Park Schoolhouse, also called uh, school number 90. There were about 100 one-room schoolhouses in Johnson County at the height of um, these small rural schools. They were meant to be within a walkable distance for most folks um, when Johnson County was a rural agricultural area. It was built, uh, you can see it on the screen here in a, sort of a, a little overview of what it had and did not have. It was built in the late 1880s as a one-room school 
Uh, it was later expanded into a two-room school uh, and a basement lunchroom, that white door that's open on the bottom left there was where the lunchroom was. Uh, it was eventually added. When the school was segregated, it became known in the community as Madam C.J. Walker School, or the Walker School. It was named for the famous black female entrepreneur and philanthropist. Uh, it served between 40 and 50 students in just two classrooms. And I'd like to see uh, if we can try something a little interactive here. Uh, in the, let's see, Q&A, can anybody tell me how many grades were serviced in this, in this school with just two classrooms? This is uh, a question I'm asking you all for, I have two, for the first two answers, I have two, uh, one museum admission passes for you all. You can come see the main exhibit and our upcoming temporary exhibit for free. I have two answers already from Amy and Becky. You were both correct. Uh, South Park School served eight grades in two classrooms. Um, and the teachers there, there were two of them at most. Uh, at times, there were only one. Uh, and this was not unusual for one-room schoolhouses across the county and actually across the nation. Sometimes you would have all eight classes in one classroom, and the teacher would rely on the older students sometimes to help younger students because they couldn't give lessons to all eight grades at the same time. So again, we have 40 to 50 students in eight grades, two classrooms and two teachers. And you can see the school lacked the most basic amenities, no indoor plumbing or toilets, no electricity, no central heating. Students received hand-me-down books uh, and educational supplies that were deemed outdated or unusable at the, at the counterpart white school. Walker School did not lack for dilapidation, unfortunately. There were holes in the roof, so it leaked when it rained. Uh, the basement lunchroom flooded every time that it rained. Um, so students would sit with their feet in puddles as they ate. To be somewhat fair, um, most one-room schoolhouses lacked amenities like indoor plumbing and central heating. Um, but the Walker School was an unequal facility, even when it was compared to its counterpart, White School, that was built in 1912. Jim Crow, a label uh, for the segregation and lack of civil rights that African Americans experienced between the end of the Civil War and the Civil Rights era of the 1960s, mandated an idea of separate but equal. It's a phrase you may be familiar with for nearly everything in society, separate drinking fountains, entrances to buildings, sections on a bus, schoolhouses. Uh, separate but equal, though, was a hollow slogan. It was uh, because conditions were rarely equal between any of those things for black citizens and white citizens. To make matters worse, in 1947, the school board for South Park built a brand new modern school building there. Change the slide. You can see it there. Uh, shown here, the South Park school building uh, was built with $90,000 in taxpayer bonds that were paid by everyone in the community, so black and white families alike uh, in South Park paid for this school. However, the school board uh, declared that the new building was only for the district's 222 white students. Black students would continue to attend the Walker School. The new building was state-of-the-art. It was the most modern school building in 1947 within Johnson County. You can see it was fireproof. It had indoor plumbing, a centralized heating system, multiple classrooms for multiple grades, including a kindergarten, a designated auditorium and lunchroom, and a new playground. Educational standards, textbooks, and availability supplies were higher there than at most Johnson County schools at the time, and certainly more available than at the Walker School. Black parents were understandably upset about the conditions at the Walker School and that their students were not permitted to attend this new school that they had a part uh, in, in paying for. They pressed the school board for repairs and higher educational standards for their children. Uh, and the school board promised that it would authorize work on the Walker School just as soon as the debt from the new school was retired in 30 years. Um, as a quick fix, uh, the school board installed a new mailbox and a stop sign in front of the Walker School, essentially doing nothing to improve the actual conditions that black students were expected to learn in. We'll meet one of the main actors, historical actors in this period, uh, the Webb family. Uh, the Webb family lived in South Park. Um, Alfonso Webb, his parents lived there for quite some time. 
they decided to do something about this situation. Um, Kansas in general, and then specifically South Park, had attracted many exodusters. It's a, a term used to talk about formerly enslaved African Americans who migrated out of the South after the Civil War. Um, and Alfonso uh, Webb's parents had moved to South Park, Kansas, from North Carolina around the turn of the century. By the 1940s, the community boasted more than 40 black families. And the Webbs, Alfonso, and his wife, Mary Humphreys, who was born in Quindaro, which is in Wyandotte County, part of KCK today, Kansas City, Kansas, uh, they started a home there together in 1937 after they were married. Mary cleaned and took in uh, laundry from white families in the area. And Alfonso worked odd jobs and agricultural jobs uh, until he started his own concrete cement business. Uh, both were active in the South Park Community Club, uh, and the whole family attended Mount Olive Baptist Church. Their 10 children, five boys and five girls, all attended the Walker School. The Webbs were really instrumental in pushing the school board uh, to address the inequities of the Walker School, and they were also instrumental in gathering support from other black families within the South Park community to challenge the school board. Now, I'm not saying they were successful, but they continued to push the school board and, and agitate within the community uh, in, a, in a way that kept this front of mind for all of the families that lived in South Park and as, as well as the school board. Uh, another uh, historical actor, Esther Brown. Um, so as the Webbs uh, and the other black families from South Park continued to push the school board for changes and repairs, other people got involved in the, in the fight as well. And so one of these uh, people is Esther Brown shown here. She described herself in one interview about this topic as a housewife with a conscience. Um, she heard about the struggle. Uh, she was a, a South Park resident, I should say, a, a white Jewish woman. And she heard about the struggle for the schools there from her domestic worker, Helen Swan. And um, Brown immediately threw her, her aid and her support behind black families in South Park. She was very interested in civil rights and had been an activist in other communities before she moved to South Park with her husband. Um, and her repeated attempts to push the school board into action yielded nothing but racist jeers and veiled threats from both the school board uh, as well as the, um, the attendees at the meetings that she would go to. Uh, this picture here was taken in 1950, just after these episodes. Um, and she received threatening phone calls throughout um, the, this era in history at all hours of the day. Uh, she was called a communist. She was called the terrible racial names. Alfonso and Mary Webb um, is sort of the, the leaders of this initiative uh, and um, keeping things at front of mind, experienced similar harassment, including having their home's back porch set on fire in the middle of the night. Uh, to attempt to put an end to this issue, uh, the school board passed a zoning regulation that gerrymandered the South Park community so that there were two smaller districts within the South Park school district, um, meaning that white students and black students students attended different schools. This, this gerrymandering was based on race. And it, in some cases, students had to walk past one school in order to attend their assigned institution. And so uh, things started to come to a head. Um, the Webbs, with all the support that was given from other families in South Park, decided to take matters into their own hands uh, and actually make uh, a substantial movement here. In May 1948, Alfonso Webb filed a lawsuit directly with the Supreme Court of Kansas in the name of his sons, Harvey and Alfonso Webb Jr., second and first grade students at the Walker School. The lawsuit uh, demanded that black students be admitted to the new South Park School. The lawsuit bypassed the issue of separate but equal and instead pointed out that segregation of school students in a town the size of Merriam or South Park uh, was unconstitutional according to Kansas statute at the time. When black students were again denied entry into the new school building at the start of the school year in 1948, so in September of 1948, 39 of the 41 black students at Walker School and both of their teachers refused to go to school there. Um, they boycotted and it was called Walker's walkout in the press at the time. It lasted the entire school year. You can see the, the picture here of both teachers and all of the students defiantly sitting with their arms crossed. I love this photograph. Teachers Corinthian Nutter in the upper left and uh, Hazel uh, McRae Weddington in the upper right agreed to continue to teach their students um, in living rooms and church basements during this period so that their students wouldn't suffer by not having a school to go to during this boycott. 
Their pay came from bake sale and fish fry proceeds and donations gathered by Esther Brown and the NAACP National Chapter. As Mary Webb later said in an oral history with the museum, the Johnson County Museum, she said, quote, we wanted something better for our children, end quote. It's a very simple quote um, underneath this very complex legal issue at the time. Uh, and so did the teachers. Um, they wanted that for their students as well. So who was Corinthian Nutter? She was born uh, in Dallas, Texas in 1907. Uh, she moved to Kansas City area in 1920 uh, at the age of 13 with her family and several years later attended uh, Western University, which was an all black college located in Quindaro in Wyandotte County. She worked as a hairdresser uh, to pay for her education. Uh, she later of course works at um, South Park School named Madam C.J. Walker School. And there's a part of me that wonders uh, with a little more research if we might be able to find out if Corinthian Nutter worked for the uh, Walker um, hair care uh, product line. There was a series of schools that were set up across the nation in black communities. Madam Walker uh, was the first uh, philanthropist and, and entrepreneur businesswoman, she was black, to really focus on women uh, and beauty, beauty products, hair products, specifically for black women. And so I think it could be an interesting connection with some more research. In any case, uh, in the late 1930s, she earned her, her teaching certificate and set out to start her career in education. She started in 1938 in her first position at the Dunbar School, which was a segregated school in Shawnee here in Johnson County. She was the only teacher there and she taught all eight grade levels. A few years later in 1943, Nutter became the uh, one of two educators at Walker School in South Park. And she stayed on there after the walkout and that she did that uh, and was instrumental, it seems, in arranging the walkout with the Webb family speaks volumes about how much she valued her students their education and their civil rights. Her fellow instructor, Hazel McCray Weddington, taught grades one through four out of a home during the boycott. And Corinthian Nutter taught grades five through eight out of the home of Mr. and Mrs. Berry in South Park. Um, out of the South Park Community Club, uh, which was an existing uh, organization, black families in South Park organized Johnson County's first branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. It was formed in January 1948, a few months uh, ahead of the lawsuit and walkout, but was really instrumental because it connected the struggle in South Park to the national chapter of the NAACP, which meant that they could provide support, both financial and legal, to the struggle in South Park. In fact, the South Park story was told in the NAACP's publication called The Crisis in May and December 1949. These stories uh, raised the profile of what was happening here in Johnson County to the national level. And donations came in from around the country to help pay Corinthian Nutter and, and Hazel McCray Weddington salaries, as well as legal fees for this, this case and the lawsuit that uh, I'm going to talk about in just a second. The national chapter also provided lawyers um, for the Webb v. School District Number 90 lawsuit. Uh, among the lawyers was future U.S. Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, Marshall maintained that, quote, complete equality of educational opportunities cannot be obtained in a dual system of education, end quote, meaning segregated schools. Um, an assistant counsel uh, for Marshall wrote that, quote, border states as Kansas is, uh, which do not have the type of segregation laws which exist in so-called southern states, present an excellent opportunity to break down the segregation which has been arbitrarily practiced by local school boards, end quote. All this to say the NAACP was strategic in their approach to and selection of the South Park case as a candidate for their support. This photo is from 1948 and you can clearly see Alfonso Webb in the upper left there and also Esther Brown labeled in the, in the front row towards the right. Um, they were instrumental along with the Swan family uh, in founding this Merriam chapter of the NAACP. And Elsa Webb, uh, who became the first uh, chapter president, was very involved, obviously. Uh, following this case, interestingly, the NAACP branch uh, dissolved due to a lack of paying members. Uh, and the current Johnson County, Kansas chapter was founded in the 1970s. So we're getting into the lawsuit itself now. Um, it was heard by the Kansas Supreme Court starting in April 1949. So a little over, uh, about a year after it was filed, I guess. Um, Corinthian Nutter 
provided key testimony during the, the, the trial, speaking perhaps better than anybody else could to the conditions that she was expected to work in as an educator at the South Park School and that her students were expe expected to learn in there. Uh, the NAACP lawyers made clear that the Walker School was in no way an equal facility to the new South Park School in clear violation of the philosophy of separate but equal. But they went beyond that. The lawyers extended their argument to claim that South Park School Board had violated the state statute uh, by segregating school students um, because the school, it, the town that the school was in was actually less than 15,000 residents. And the statute at the time said that towns that were smaller than 15,000 could not segregate their schools. It's an arbitrary requirement, an arbitrary statute, it seems. Uh, at the time, they were called second class cities. Uh, but the law, uh, that was the law that Kansas was operating under. And you can see uh, a quote from Corinthian Nutter's testimony. She said, schools shouldn't be for a color, they should be for children. The Supreme Court decision came uh, in June of 1949, a few months after it started. Uh, the body found that the actions of the, school, uh, the South Park School Board were, quote, arbitrary and unreasonable in an attempt by subterfuge, meaning deception, to bring about segregation, which the laws of the state do not permit, end quote. You can see another quote on the screen there, um, very forceful in its wording, uh, about segregation and not being lawful. There had been a Kansas law in 1879, as I, as I mentioned, that does not permit segregated schools in towns below 15,000 people, as South Park and Miriam both were at the time. But the South Park School Board had gone be, uh, beyond that and maintained a segregated school facility. On top of that, they'd explicitly created an all-blacks district within the school district based solely on race. The court said two schools could exist within a school district, but, quote, those educational facilities of two schools maintained in the same school district must be on a comparable basis at all times and not based on race, end quote. Supreme Court said that if this was not possible to maintain two separate schools, and quote, the colored pupils and all pupils of District 90 must be permitted to attend the South Park District School beginning with the school year of 1949 to 50, end quote. To be clear, the court was ordering that schools be equal in every way and not based on race of the students who attended the school. It was interesting because it did not uphold Jim Crow's separate but equal philosophy or ideology that the Kansas Supreme Court found that the school should be integrated um, ultimately if the second school could not be made comparable to the new one was likely a surprise to everyone involved. That was their hope, of course, that was their aim in the lawsuit, but it was probably surprising. Um, it would be another five years until this, another court case in Kansas uh, tested and successfully overcame the idea of separate but equal education um, when Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka uh, is heard in 1954. Of course, that court case will lead to the national integration of schools um, and like that, that case itself, um, which came from the U.S. Supreme Court, not Kansas Supreme Court, it took time to implement, um, and not everyone was thrilled to integrate schools, so there was some feet dragging in, involved as well. Uh, and this was also true in South Park. Uh, despite the very clear directives of the Kansas Supreme Court to either create a, an equal facility, a separate facility uh, that was not based on race, or integrate the school, the school board in South Park continued to drag its feet to obstruct um, this from coming about. Uh, they did not immediately give in to the Kansas Supreme Court's demands. In fact, following the announcement of the decision uh, uh, in Webb v. School District 90, the board sought to try to keep the facility segregated voluntarily, uh, in quotes. According to the NAACP's magazine, Crisis, uh, the de December 1949 issue, petitions were circulated by white citizens via a few quote, black favor seekers, end quote, resulting in 51% of the black population of South Park signing on to this petition to maintain the school segregation voluntarily. But uh, the NAACP uh, publication makes clear that they had been told the site would be used as a pre-kindergarten and recreation hall uh, when they were signing that petition. A subsequent secret school board meeting commenced and the same few favor seekers attended speaking on behalf of their black neighbors, stating that the community had no desire to send their children to the white school. Painters and carpenters started to work on the Walker School right away. It's notable that all of these volunteers were white residents of South Park. Uh, and the school board filed a motion with the Supreme Court uh, asking for permi permission to operate uh, the segregated school voluntarily. 
But black parents realized this duplicity was happening and signed and submitted a separate petition to the Supreme Court stating, quote, uh, or to the effect, quote, that under no circumstances, under no conditions, would their children be sent to any school other than the new one in South Park, end quote. At a separate meeting of the school board, the board claimed that they had received permission from the Supreme Court to build a $60,000 school for black students. Not sure if this is true or not, uh, but they do this by spending $5,000 over the next 12 years. Again, clearly feet dragging. The assembled parents uh, at that school board meeting made clear again their demand to attend the South Park School. Uh, and this seems to have been the end of attempts to maintain segregation by the South Park School Board. So our legacies coming out of this, uh, on September, uh, September 9th, 1949, black students attended uh, the South Park Elementary School, that 1947 building, for the first time. Um, additionally, five to seven black high school students, the reports vary in media from around the area, attended Shawnee Mission Rural High School for the first time. It's Shawnee Mission North today. The northern part of the county had never provided for high school education for black students. Um, and those who wanted to continue their education past the eighth grade uh, were privately sent to, expected to send their students privately uh, to schools in Wyandotte County. Um, as an aside, the McCallop family of Shawnee uh, was instrumental in making sure that black students could reach those schools in Kansas City, Kansas, Sumner High School, especially in Western University for college, um, and developed and operated a, a private bus line to take black high school and college students there on a daily basis. Interestingly, when the fall term started in 1949, the South Park School Board had hired three new teachers to staff the Walker School. According to the NAACP publication, they sat, quiet, uh, they sat quote, <laughs> patiently for two and a half days waiting in vain for a child to enroll. Not one student came, end quote. After that, Walker School was subsequently closed and served later as a home to a lumber company in the 1950s, later a short-lived community youth center in the 1960s, and in 1963 became home to the Philadelphia Baptist Church, which it still is today. You can see a picture that was taken two years ago um, and the historic marker that's out front of the Philadelphia Baptist Church. In 1947, South Park School, the, excuse me, the 1947 South Park School was later replaced uh, and the building itself became a church. South Park was then annexed uh, by Merriam in 1967. The Webb lawsuit was the 11th school segregation case to reach the Kansas Supreme Court by 1949. It held that segregated schools in small towns were unconstitutional and that separate schools facilities must be equal in nature. The next step uh, was to challenge that separate but equal philosophy altogether, meaning in towns with populations larger than 15,000 people, called first class towns or cities at the time, uh, where state statute permitted school segregation in these larger uh, towns. This was accomplished, as I said, um, five years later with Brown v. Board uh, in 1954. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled that despite equal facilities and other, quote, tangible factors, end quote, separate schools could never be equal. For black students, according to the U.S. Supreme Court, segregated facilities, quote, generate a feeling of inferiority as to their status that may affect the hearts and minds in a way unlikely ever to be undone, end quote. Ultimately, the court declared that segregated schools deprive black students of equal protection under the law guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. All schools in the U.S. were subsequently ordered to be integrated. At a party thrown to celebrate the Brown v. Board decision, uh, Esther Brown said, quote, little people like us bring about such things. The most brilliant lawyers couldn't have su succeeded, but for the help of people like you here tonight, end quote. There's a great quote there from Mary Webb from an oral history that we have at the museum. Um, despite the legal victory uh, in Webb v. School District Number 90, the path forward in South Park was not an easy one. Decades of segregation had left their mark on the community, and both white and black students were apprehensive about integration. While newspapers proudly reported that black students uh, attended Johnson County schools without incident, uh, some students did, in fact, encounter overt racism when they attended the new school there. Mary Wynne Rowland recalled in one newspaper interview, quote, going to South Park School was very traumatic for me. The color of my skin never mattered until I went to South Park. The children would turn away from me. They called me maid and said on the playground I could not swing but had to push them, end quote. 
For the Webb family, despite these difficulties, access to better education and complete education through high school really reshaped their family. Their children graduated high school, several attended college and took professional jobs. Mary and Alfonso are shown in this photograph with their granddaughter, Robin Williams, uh, who in the 1990s was a star athlete at Johnny Mission Schools and an exceptional student with several college, uh, college scholarships uh, available to her. And following up on Corinthian Nutter's legacy, um, following the integration of South Park School, Corinthian Nutter was left without a job. Um, South Park was not interested in hiring her into the new facility. Despite her activism, or perhaps because of it, Nutter next taught at Olathe's All Black Lincoln School, where she also served as a principal. Nutter later taught at Olathe's Westview Elementary, where she was the only black teacher among a school population that remained all white until 1970. Two years later, she retired as principal of that school. The picture on the left here was taken in 1970. Uh, Corinth and Nutter often spoke to reporters and for programming about South Park, but she announced her retirement from speeches in 1999. After her retirement, uh, Nutter remained active in the community. She was honored by the NAACP and the American Association of University Women. She received the YWCA of Greater Kansas City's very first racial justice award and was inducted into the Mid-America Education Hall of Fame for her role in the civil rights movement and the dedication she had to education for all students. The picture on the right was taken in 2003, just a year before she passed away at the age of 98. So I'll end with a few thoughts here and we'll open it up to questions. Um, the activity in South Park was really important. Uh, it was a really important part of the buildup in terms of legal cases, attitudes, actions, personal convictions that led to the eventual integration of schools nationally. While it was not a contributing case uh, in the Brown v. Board lawsuit, it certainly played an important role in serving as one of the capstones uh, on a foundation of legal decisions in Kansas and other states supporting the integration that Brown v. Board would later bring. As the NAACP publication noted in December 1949, quote, this story deserves to be told. Neither bloodshed nor rioting has resulted from the integration of the colored and white children. The only noticeable result is that one school is bigger and better than it has ever been before, and the children of both races are being benefited thereby and from their daily living in a democratic school community, end quote. It's important to remember that the South Park School episode included overtly racist words, actions, and attitudes. Um, there was name calling, there were threats, there was a porch set on fire, property damage. Um, on the other hand, as the NAACP noted, when integration actually occurred, when it was mandated by the Kansas Supreme Court, it happened without major incident in South Park, which perhaps is a low bar to judge by, but one that not every community in the United States would reach when integration happens nationally. Um, those in Johnson County who opposed integration did not disappear from the landscape, but they did lose their fight for continued segregation. There were many episodes in the history um, that have brought Johnson County closer to an equal, just society, um, sort of the ideal society that we like to talk about. And the South Park school case is certainly one of the most notable. As Dolores Ginns, a friend of Corinthian Nutter, recalled about the events in 1949 for a newspaper interview, she said, quote, the important thing was that children were educated minds were changed and hearts were changed, end quote. So um, thank you very much for listening uh, to this past is prologue uh, presentation. I'd love to take your questions if you put them in the Q&A. Um, I'll pull up my contact info and information about the uh, Johnson County Museum. If you want to send me inquiries to that email address, I'm happy to answer those. Um, I'd also like to encourage you to visit the Johnson County Museum and our online repository, jocohistory.org, uh, where you can see lots of photographs, um, and newspapers and um, uh, past articles and things that were written by the museum and the library and other historical institutions around the county. At the Johnson County Museum, we proudly talk about this history um, in our exhibits and our tours um, as part of the larger Johnson County history. This is an integral part. So uh, it's been a real pleasure talking about it today and I look forward to your questions. All right, thank you very much, Andrew. We have had a couple of questions come in. So Great. just with, um, did Thurgood Marshall have any other cases in Kansas? 
Yeah, I believe he worked on a uh, case that was in Wichita about the same time. And I th I might be wrong. I, I want to say he was also involved in the Brown v. Board of Education case in, in 1954. Um, that's a good question, though. I'm not I'm not entirely sure. I'm sorry. All right. And were any other schools segregated in Johnson County besides the South Park Walker schools? Yeah. So um, Shawnee's Dunbar School was segregated. Um, and then also in Olathe. And these are sort of the larger areas of population leading up to you know, suburbanization. Uh, in Olathe, the Lincoln School. And, and Olathe, by that time, was large enough to be counted as a first class city. And so it had legally. Uh, a segregated school, MET statute. Um, and so those three places now, uh, we have photographs uh, as evidence of places uh, in Wilder, Clare School, which is by Gardner and others um, that show a very diverse population of students at, at very small schools, these one room schools. Um, and I'm talking about black students, white students, Latino students in 1900, 1920, 1940 at these one room schoolhouses. So it's interesting. Um, that at the same time, we have these sort of, that's pretty early, I think, for a lot of people to think about there being a substantial Latino population and black populations outside of somewhere like Olathe in the 1920s. But there were these diverse populations there. So while we have that happening in the 1920s, here we are in 1949, um, after World War II, as suburbanization is starting, as the highway system is being built, we have this school in South Park that is um, still being um, kept segregated. So I hope that answers the question, sort of a long-winded answer, I guess. Uh, where was the school located in Merriam? That's a great question. Um, it is the South Phil uh, no, the Philadelphia Baptist Church. So um, pull it up on my Google Maps here real, very quickly, and maybe I can tell you. Uh, so the school building still stands, and it has um, that historical marker in front of it. And in fact, nearby um, is a park that was named for Esther Brown and her work um, because of her work in the South Park um, case, Philadelphia. Let's see if I can spell it correctly. It is on West 50th Terrace, um, for anyone who's interested, um, sort of in the heart of and that residential area in South Park, right across from Brown Memorial Park, and that I'm talking about, named after Esther Brown. Okay, thank you. Uh, are any of Corinthian Nutter's family members still alive and living around Johnson County? Ooh, I do not know about Corinthian Nutter. I do know that there are members of, I mentioned the McKellop family who provided a way for students to go to Wyandotte County for high school and college. Their families are still in the area in Shawnee. And then several of these families, uh, the Webb family still has um, folks living in South Park, I believe, Merriam. Uh, and lots of those students, I think, are still in the area. Uh, Corinthian Nutter was very involved in the community and, and kept in contact with her students from across her career, uh, even after she retired. Um, uh, even though she did, I believe, move to uh, Kansas City, Missouri uh, after her retirement. So I'm not sure about her family, uh, but again, lots of these descendants of historical actors and perhaps some folks who were attending school uh, at this time uh, in early grades, first grade, second grade, are, are still living here in, in Johnson County. All right. Uh, is most of this information available in the exhibit at the museum? Uh, some of this information is. It doesn't go into quite this amount of detail uh, in the main exhibit, um, the physical exhibit. We do have uh, a virtual museum um, accessible on our website. And included in that is Hidden Stories of the Webb Family. And it really has a lot of this information. I've given more detail today than, than that exhibit goes into it. Well, it's a digital online exhibit. But you can read more about that there and see some of these photographs as well. You'll also find a lot of these photographs um, and some of the maps and things that, that I showed today um, on that jocohistory.org website. You can go specifically to the Johnson County Museum. It's fully searchable. You could search Corinthian Nutter, you could search South Park, um, uh, Esther Brown, uh, and find those photographs. And then there's a whole section of Atlas Maps um, of Johnson County where you'd find those, those uh, images that I pulled for the, for the presentation. 
All right, someone comments, I live in this area and I've heard that South Park was named for being south of the railroad yards in Wyandotte. Do you know if this is accurate? Again, I'm not sure uh, that there's any consensus on where the name came from, but uh, that makes sense to me. It, it makes sense to me also that it could be just because it was south of the Wyandotte line. Um, uh, so I don't, I don't know that we have a definite answer, uh, but, that, but that seems like a plausible explanation as well. Okay. This next question, I think you've answered, but just to reiterate, uh, is there currently a display on Corinthian Netter at the museum, um, or is it in a larger display? I think it's asking, is it in the permanent mm -hmm. exhibit or is it in a temporary one? Yeah, it's part of the larger display, the, the permanent exhibit um, here. Uh, and then there's also that digital exhibit that I talked about. And as far as I know, um, I've been here three years, but a Several years ago, before I came, um, there was an exhibit that was created, a small uh, physical exhibit that was put in the school there, the newer South Park School, uh, to talk about this history. It may be there as well. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I haven't been to that school. Uh, do you know when were black teachers hired at South Park? Ooh, that is a great question. I do not. Um, I'm gonna write that one down and maybe we'll do a social media post if I can find out um, when or if uh, black teachers were hired at South Park. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, so you said the Dunbar School in Shawnee is where uh, black students attended school. Uh, so what school in Shawnee did white students attend at this time? They would have attended uh, another another one room school. Uh, I'm not sure of the name actually, but uh, and Dunbar again. So what's really interesting is a lot of these smaller communities started off um, with integrated schools because it was expensive to maintain a school, to hire a teacher, to buy the books. Uh, and so when Johnson County was primarily agricultural, these one room schoolhouses served as integrated institutions. Right, they had to. It was just out of necessity. As we start to get closer to 1900 and then into World War I and World War II, um, across the nation, the idea of segregation became much more important. Um, besides the exodusters who left the South after the Civil War, there was something called the Great Migration um, coming, starting in World War I, leading all the, all the way through World War II and really until 1970. Um, and the Great Migration was the movement of um, African-Americans who had worked agricultural jobs, essentially living in the same farms or plantations that, that ancestors would have when they were enslaved, leaving the South and going to the industrial North, um, places like Chicago, Philadelphia, Baltimore, New York City, uh, also west to California. And then of course, Kansas City with its rail yard, meat packing industry, um, construction, uh, wartime activity, building bombers and things. Kansas City was a, a really desirable place uh, for these black families to move. Um, and now I've lost track of what that question originally was. Um, can you it say it again? The, the school that white students attended in Shawnee. Oh, yeah. So when all of this started, when, when more um, black families started to move into areas, segregation became a much more important issue to white families. And this is not just in, in Johnson County or Kansas City, this across the nation. Um, and so that's when we start to see schools, if they were able to financially uh, take it on, creating a secondary school. And that usually meant to the, you know, they were to the detriment of the school that became the black school, um, the all black school. So Dunbar was originally an integrated school in Shawnee. Um, and then it was um, turned over to an all black institution, an all black school um, and really declined. It was never kept up uh, like a lot of these. And in Olathe, I should say that that all black school, Lincoln school um, uh, and the churches that were also in that community were in Fairview, uh, an area literally across the tracks, um, the northwestern quadrant of Olathe was an, was originally an all-black community called Fairview, um, had a business district, had churches, had the school, uh, and was sort of a separate uh, area from downtown. Um, yeah. Interesting. Um, could you repeat the size of towns that were not allowed to segregate? Yes. So. Um, Towns that were, were places that were more than 15,000 residents. Those were first class cities. That's how they talked about them at the time. Uh, second class cities were under 15,000. So if you had less than 15,000 residents uh, living in your town, you were not permitted to have, by state statute anyway, uh, a segregated school system. Now, 
that didn't stop places, obviously. South Park, John E. Um, at one point, Olathe wouldn't have qualified for that, but did anyway have separate institutions there. Um, so, and that's sort of what Thurgood Marshall and uh, his assistant counsel um, was talking about, right? That places along the border, like Kansas, uh, border being to what was originally the pro-slavery South, these places um, got away with segregation uh, because they, they talked about themselves as being very friendly to black residents, being an, a more open society than the South, and yet they were uh, enforcing segregation in schools unlawfully, right? And that's why they thought those areas might be the easiest to crack. It was hard to go into somewhere like the Deep South um, and crack that really extreme Jim Crow, you know, um, atmosphere. Whereas in places like Kansas and other places along that border, especially in the West, um, there were some real clear laws about what this should look like, uh, what towns could and could not segregate their schools. And it was successful, right, uh, in South Park. So 15,000 and under were to be integrated uh, schools. Technically. 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 <laughs> uh, so the most recent uh, South Park school was built at Antioch and 49th. And is that where the South Park school was, do you know? Uh, as far as I know, all three South Park schools are still standing. So the one by, that is now Philadelphia Baptist Baptist Church on whatever I said, West uh, 50th Terrace, I think. Yeah, West 50th Terrace. Yeah, West 50th Terrace. The um, then, of course, after 1912, there was a separate white one room schoolhouse. Right. That one uh, met with several different natural disasters. I think there was a fire. There was also a tornado. Uh, that damaged it. And so then in 1947, they decided to build um, the South Park School, the one we're talking about, that new institution. That still stands, as far as I know, uh, in South Park. It was turned into a church. And so the one that exists there today uh, is a third uh, school within that community, really the fourth school, I guess, um, within South Park. Okay. Is the Sewing family part of this history? They are not part of this history specifically, but they are part of this larger story, right, of civil rights uh, in Johnson County's suburban areas. So the Sewing family, another really interesting story that we tell in the main exhibit, um, they came in in the 1960s. So in 1960, um, Donald Sewing, he was a realtor in, in Wyandotte County in Kansas City, Kansas, through a series of straw buyers, purchases a house in Fairway. And what that means is um, there were racial restrictive covenants on those properties things that literally in the deed for the property says you cannot sell to a black family. They are not permitted by law to live here. Those restrictive covenants were defeated in 1948 uh, in a court case coming out of Missouri. Again, this technical thing, right? Technically they were defeated. They were still on the books and they still are in some communities across the nation. Um, and they were still on the books in fair and fair. Um, you know what I'm trying to say? Fairway. <laughs> I said Fairview earlier. There's two separate communities, Fairview and Olathe, Fairway by Mission Hills. Uh, so anyway, they purchase a house there. And over the next, um, they use a series of straw buyers to purchase it because they weren't legally, as a black family, they weren't legally able to purchase that house. And so there was a rapid succession of sales and eventually they purchased the house. They, over the next decade, work with 60 black families um, purchasing houses for them uh, in different areas of suburban northeastern Johnson County. Um, and they claim the sewing family and, and rightfully that they integrated suburban Johnson County. Now, of course, we know that there were black families living in places like South Park and Merriam. They were living in Fairview. They were living in, in smaller agricultural areas like Gardner, um, uh, Wilder, Holiday. Uh, but really, these, these large suburban neighborhoods that were developed after World War II, most of them had racial restrictive covenants on them. And um, the FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, put uh, uh, a racial component on their uh, uh, on the ability to get a, an insured mortgage through them. Uh, they really just didn't work with black families. Something like less than one percent of home sales in the Kansas City area went to black families through the FHA. So uh, when Donald Sewing talks about being the first person to integrate the northeastern suburban neighborhoods, he's really right. Uh, and these, again, are sort of tied together and, and to these more modern issues, right, about who can live in a community, who has a voice in a community, uh, how do we become a more just and equal uh, a society, 
Um, these are all really tied together. Donald Sewing, the South Park School uh, case, the Webbs and, and Corinthian Nutter and Esther Brown, and then also uh, the McCallop family having to drive students to Wyandotte County to be able to attend high school and college. Yes, thank you for that. Definitely lots of topics for future issues of this program. Yeah, that's right. Uh, former librarian from the Marion Park School uh, wrote in that she says the eight panel exhibit about this is on the wall at Marion Park School. Uh, oh, so Marion Schools merged in 2006 in a new building and the panels are also available on the museum website. So that's good information to know. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, what other question? I'm sorry, I talked through you. Sorry, what are straw buyers? Ah, straw buyers, so um, straw buyers are people who stand in to purchase something and it's usually done in a rapid succession. So you may have five different white families who on the same day, buy and sell a house to each other down the line until uh, it goes to a black family so that um, it would be very difficult to then trace that in, in the legal documentation, right? Um, because a realtor just wouldn't work with, often would not work with uh, black families who were interested in purchasing homes in suburban areas. And again, this isn't just in Kansas City, this is around the nation, um, but it's especially uh, true in Johnson County's suburban areas outside of Kansas City, Missouri. So straw buyers were, were used to be able to sell homes um, to black families. Okay. All right, we've had several questions come in about this presentation is being recorded and will be available later. Uh, in theory, yes, this is a new platform for the library and barring any technical difficulties on my end, uh, this should be available after the fact. Uh, watch the Joko Library website and social media for information on that. Uh, I think that is all of our questions. So thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for that presentation. And thank you to the Johnson County Library staff who helped make this program possible. Uh, thank you all so much for attending our program today. We couldn't do this if you all weren't interested in it. And so I really appreciate that. Uh, let me push, there's a poll on the screen now that uh, asks where you heard about this program. So if you could just quickly select that so we know where to advertise this in the future. Uh, our next The Past is Prologue program will feature Angela Bates from the Nicodemus Historical Society. She's gonna present on the history of Nicodemus, Kansas out in Western Kansas, a town that was founded uh, by the Exodusters referenced in this presentation. So it all ties together very well. Uh, this program will be on Thursday, January 7th, so in 2021, and it will be an evening program at 7 p.m. So watch again the website jocolibrary.org for the registration for that. So thank you all so much for attending, and we will see you in January. Thank you.